Thank you everyone for coming to the Data Lead Centered Leadership Podcast. Today we have an incredibly exciting and accomplished guest. His name is Mark Montgomery. He's the founder of K Yield Incorporated. K Yield Incorporated offers systems and services surrounding the K Yield operating system that are based on a new theorem, which he developed in the 1990s called the Yield Management of, of Knowledge. This theorem substantially is substantially covered by an AI patent system patent issued in 2011 called Modular System for Optimizing Knowledge Yield in the Digital Workplace. And the standard modular K yield operating system provides several critical functions across distributed networks, including network governance, proprietary security, enhanced productivity, and continuous improvement. So thank you, Mark, for taking the time out of your schedule to. Well, thanks for inviting me, Tyler. I guess we need to revisit that and shorten it a little bit. Uh, where, where have you got that? But anyhow, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I noticed um, you started this company on your, from your, on your own, right? In about 20 years ago? Yeah, well, it's, we, we only incorporated uh, last year, actually. Uh, but uh, carried as a sole proprietorship this entire time. Uh, nice. It was originally conceived in our, we had a small lab in Northern Arizona on our property. Um, and I was running, um, I guess we'll probably get into this later, but I was running a, a couple of networks and an incubator, what we called at the time, a knowledge systems lab, uh, cool. which is a subsector of AI. Um, and there was only a, a few of them. Uh, you know, Stanford has, I think still probably has the largest one of the largest, but there, right. there weren't very many of them. And so we were doing a lot of cutting edge stuff, but that's where it was uh, originally conceived. And, uh, um, and then we, you know, we founded a, an early stage uh, deep tech uh, VC firm and, and had another entity. Uh, my only partner at the time was uh, Dr. Russell Borland, my late mm -hmm. friend. Uh, he was one of the early guys at Microsoft. He was, um, I think he was team lead with Word. And he wrote wow. books on, uh, he wrote the book on exchange and all kinds of stuff. Uh, he was he was one of the early guys. So anyhow, that's a just a bit a little blip of the background here. Long long time, a lot older, a lot more gray hair than when I started for sure. I'm closer to your age when I started this. Oh, exciting! So I, it seems like you have a really unique background. Uh, like you've done quite a bit in business and computer science. Yeah, well, you're being polite, a lot more polite than some of my academic friends. Um, yeah, it's, it is unusual background for sure, uh, in, especially in, in AI systems, because most people, I mean, most of the people that I consider peers are, are academics, and, and, and they've moved the other way in that um, you know, quite a few of them are professors part-time and also working in, in, uh, in mostly big tech, but a few others. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there was very few of us involved back then. In fact, sort of the last uh, uh, AI winter was in about 95 or so. And oh, so, wow. you know, one of the reasons we, you called it a knowledge systems lab, uh, it, it certainly wasn't to raise a lot of money back in those days. I mean, everybody was doing dot-com stuff back then. Uh, but in any event, that, that, that's the history of it. So, so with 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 respect to your that that background uh i'm kind of curious like what is your view on work have you always been an entrepreneur did you use like entrepreneurial spirit to get into this kind of uh, situation well it wasn't it certainly wasn't planned to get on this particular path uh it it in fact it it, it took several states uh and moves and everything before we wound up in new mexico so it's kind of a long story over 23 years but the uh um, the, the reason why um, I visited in, in, uh, in, in high school, um, we had like college visitations and stuff, and, and we visited some of the schools. I was up in Washington State, and, uh, and, and that was uh, really just about the time that Microsoft moved from New Mexico back to Washington. And so oh. Washington had just gone through uh, the Boeing crisis, and they had a terrible 70s. And they realized that they needed to diversify their economy um, uh, pr pretty badly understood it, that in, in computing was just uh, becoming mainstream. And, and so they identified uh, computing. So there were 
uh, pretty good uh, labs and things in, in the local schools up there. But when I first visited, um, they were very primitive. You know, the, the early computers in the 70s uh, yeah. really couldn't do much that were, was interesting to me. Uh, you know, I couldn't readily see uh, some exciting stuff. So I just, I just didn't get excited then. It was much later when it matured that it evolved uh, for, you know, another decade before I really got excited. And then started to see some of the applications you could do um, for business and healthcare, the rest of society. Um, so that's, that's why otherwise, you know, if things had changed a little bit different growing up and, and some family issues, uh, I, cu I could have uh, gone a more traditional path pretty easily. But in terms of being an entrepreneur, I mean, the answer to that is probably yes. In hindsight, I've, I've been asked that before. Look back, I mean, I was uh, selling lemonade at five, six years old in the commencement bay, or not commencement bay, the uh, Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. Yeah. My father was in the Air Force, and, uh, and I think it was probably somewhat natural, just a natural inclination, but they 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 uh, they didn't do anything to you know uh, steer me away from it and and perhaps maybe encourage it a little bit um and then we were off to europe and then came back and to the u.s after three years and um you know i started mowing lawns and doing things in high school i did a i got college credit for selling mm -hmm. firewood so yeah it was probably in my nice. in my blood from i don't know maybe it's in the dna uh you know <laughs> so yeah, it's it's always been. Um, I'm I am you know intellectually I'm definitely attracted to. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoy basic research. Oh, but, okay. Uh, but I'm motivated by uh, the application. So applied applied research to me gets me is is far more motivated to actually solve real problems in the real world. Um, nice. And to do that, uh, you know, that's either either as uh, an employee of a large organization, I've never been real keen on large bureaucracies, <laughs> or, you know, or an entrepreneur or working in smaller companies. So, okay. yeah. So I've had, you know, almost, uh, it depends on how you count them, but about a dozen different businesses. So, wow. Yeah. All, of all types, traditional, uh, uh, you know, during the incubator years, we had several um, in, in like K yield in the early stage, we didn't incorporate them. I learned that lesson kind of early in the in our lab was that uh, you know at first it was oh boy we're going to start a new business go out and incorporate it hire an attorney spend a lot of money and do taxes and all that. And after going through that a couple of times, you know, we were kind of pioneers in the lean venturing sort of you know they call it fast fail. Other people made fortunes becoming famous on it, but we were actually one of the very early pioneers in the mid '90s doing it. Um, and uh, and it does make sense to sort of uh, for especially in new areas where you don't know what you're doing because it's new it's a new area nobody has done it mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, that was true with e-commerce and a lot of things in the mid 90s which is new medium um, and so nobody had tried a bunch of things so it does make sense to to experiment mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know if it's not going to work out test it and everything K yields a very different type voyage it's much more traditional um and you know we can get into that more depth but it's it's uh, i compare it more like a, a pharma company uh, wow. or you know something along those lines where it's 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 far more r d intensive over a long period of time you had to wait for components uh, to come together um you know in your background working with people in material science uh, mm -hmm. Semiconductors. Uh, I suspect we probably run into a few few of the same people. Uh, uh, I I saw your background, and uh, and so uh, you know people like Craig Barrett, for example. He was involved with ASU. I had a good meeting with him back in 2007. Cool. But uh, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of that. I mean, semiconductors had to mature. A lot of things had to happen before we could get the the, the whole functionality of K yield, which happened. Really, it was 2012 before the K yield OS was was actually the the basic data over uh, in a distributed format was demonstrated, and that was actually through a uh, uh, a common vendor, and he got uh, permission of one of their big financial clients to uh, use their system, trying to sell us their you know their product, <laughs> of course, 
but uh, but it was nice because we were able to use this you know, very expensive, large system in this financial uh, services company to actually demonstrate and see that uh, the basic functionality at that point was viable. So, yeah. So it took from about 1997 to 2012 before, uh, and, and even in 2012, we're not talking about the individual module or laptops. This is just, uh, you know, in large data centers, uh, shipping across the country and bandwidth, wow. some, some of the basic things on the, on the engineering. So yeah, that's, long a big, voyage. that's a big vision. You had a big vision and you were really patient and hardworking to <sighs> Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly has taken persistence. Uh, that is for sure. And so, um, and it's kind of int been interesting because it's one of those, those hurry up and wait things. And then, uh, you know, the, a, a couple of people find a, a different way to do machine learning a few years right. ago and, and things just take off and it goes wow. crazy. So, cool. you know, uh, such is life, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so I guess, uh, I was going to ask why you chose to go from business to software, but it sounds like you kind of, uh, already elaborated on that a little bit. You said that in the nineties computers became fast enough, powerful enough to start gaining your interest. So well, you yeah, yeah, it wasn't just the fastness and powerful enough, but I, I guess in applications that's true where, um, and, and certainly the commercialization of the internet had something to do with that. I mean, okay. uh, you know. I got to know Vint Cerf and you know, some of the definitely the pioneers that were involved in it, and it uh, it it you know we were able to do some things where the potential was there wow. to radically improve life on Earth. Uh, of course, a lot of those dreams were were you know have, have, have been uh, dimmed since by some of the the ways uh, that we we've, we've done it, and some some obvious problems with uh, the advertising model and and privacy and creating problems. And, um, you know, I'm not real big on, on uh, electric uh, monopolies uh, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it certainly has had problems along the way, but at the same time, there's been, there's been a lot of both good and bad, like any technology. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's what really attracted me to it. In fact, our first venture was uh, online, was a, uh, uh, became one of the largest networks for a small business. And so I've always been an advocate for small business. So it was a, it was a, it was actually called a virtual franchise. No, nothing to do with any anybody using that name today. But it was a very experimental network for small business. And nice. So it was, it was kind of you know we definitely had uh, even though we didn't make a lot of money on that it was boy there was a huge learning curve. Uh, you know ninety six or so ninety five. So. Wow. So. Going along with that, so what was your inspiration for the idea of K Yield? I mean, it sounds like you had many ideas that that you felt could potentially change the world dramatically. Yeah, and and this actually the initial uh, the initial inspiration for K Yield specifically was we were actually running a different network then called GWIN Global Web Interactive Network, um, and that was a team of remote uh, programmers primarily in the Austin area. Um, there was a gal specializing in, in SMEs, a, a, a bright young programmer, and we connected up and she brought in some others. She came out of Dell's uh, team and they were doing some internal stuff that was somewhat similar wow. uh, with, with you know, cold fusion and, and doing some things on data. And, and so we, we built this really sort of bleeding edge at the time, Gwen was, and it ended up having a fantastic membership. Uh, is you know, the dot com rush and uh, you couldn't charge for anything then because there was so much money. Uh, you were basically paying people to sign up for, but so we did it for free and, and Russell Borland was involved then, uh, my late partner. Um, and it was very interesting. I mean, today it's nothing, but back in those days it was quite advanced. We had uh, a digital assistant called Lookout wow. um, and we were. We had dozens of disciplines that you could subscribe to. I think we had the first, uh, the first subscription where you could actually subscribe to all these different topics and, and it would be email or chat and we integrated these other programs. Um, and so we had professors from all these different disciplines. We had uh, you know, CEOs from major tech companies. We had leading investors. 
we had just a real, I mean, there was even a nun working in the Amazon jungle that was, <laughs> uh, that was using a satellite phone or something to access it. It was, that was actually one of the most fascinating things to see. So in a way it was kind of like an early LinkedIn, but, wow. uh, uh, but uh, we, you know, we didn't have advertising. We didn't, it was just free and we were learning a lot. Well, it was in the middle of that and I was actually operating it solo. So I had a data center in my sort of a garage type office, but it, we had about 1500 square foot of concrete building. So I had built my own data center um, and we're doing it all there. Um, and, uh, and, and my brother called one day and, and uh, told me that he had uh, ALS. So, oh. you know, Lou Gehrig's. And, uh, and so that, uh, by that time we were doing some experimenting with data to the point where I could see the potential for accelerating R&D. Um, and so when I delve into, that was my first deep dive in life sciences was, was because of that. Of course, what I found was very complex disease, very little was known anything about it at the time. And, uh, and even though we couldn't do anything to help him, uh, that was the original uh, sort of motivation for K yield, and so uh, actually that same later that same summer, I think is when I first came up with uh, the um, the theorem of yield management of knowledge, um, and uh, and it took me a long time to actually work out the math because I'm not a, a trained mathematician. I generally understand it, but I, you know I'm not trained on the languages and 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 not real skilled in and uh, you know developing the the theorem. So. I just did that a few years ago, actually just two, three years ago, I kind of finalized that. But, but that is the underlying theorem for the K-yield OS, and it's, it's essentially a mathematical theorem. And, and basically, it, it's, uh, you break it down to knowledge into uh, usable, uh, it could be large, it could be small, but, but uh, you know, usable elements, um, and then uh, and change it and, and, uh, and process it and do what you need to do. And the idea being that um, you know we we can uh, we can affect the knowledge yield curve. So it it it, it wasn't in, you know originally it wasn't intended to be a super intelligence or anything like that. I mean you could see eventually that it might uh, move in that direction, but it was just a, really we've mostly always been focused on enhancing the workflow of 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 people of humans and making them more productive no matter what it is that they're interested in and so that was the original uh, motivation for k yield i think i'm starting to understand what you mean by yield management of knowledge so are you saying that like the idea is that the, there's so much knowledge and it available on the internet the human brain can't really process it all we try to find little bits oh absolutely yeah not just the internet but uh, even before the internet, um, even, even even more difficult when it was uh, when it was contained in textbooks and and you know it would take uh, a, a thousand lifetimes to to grasp the human knowledge and even then of course due to experiential and all the other things you'd only be able to grasp a small amount of it but uh, but yeah I mean that's kind of what Google's thing was and. and mm -hmm. we, we tested search engines, uh, mm -hmm. actually I argued for Google's first investment because we wow. needed search really badly. We were using it in our network and the other search engines were not very good. So we did some serious research and tested the different algorithms. And, and uh, you know, it, it wasn't much uh, in today's world compared to what Google's doing today, but at the time it was the best we had. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, that was the motivation, and and, uh, and and since you had, you know, with Gwen, we were, for example, we, were, we had a news service with Lookout, and so it was tailored to the individual. So we had people from, you know, the, the intelligence agencies and DOD and professors, and they would, no matter what it was, and so you would, I have lots of different interests, so I would take economics, and I was monitoring economics and advanced technology and different things, and there was life sciences, and you could... You could sort of mix and match, the, match these things, um, and you could tell that you were picking up in this cross-disciplinary environment. Um, you, you could learn from other disciplines, and so even though it was uh, it was primitive, you you we were very limited on what we could do at the time. Uh, it, you could still see the promise, right? And so that was the idea with 
with uh, k yield is 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 a mathematical theorem that uh, if you break it down into the math uh, uh, particles as we do in business, and you know you mm -hmm. talk about yield management and revenue, or okay, uh, you know it's used in a lot of different uh, a lot of different fields. Um, you know it's a it's a fairly straightforward uh, theorem, really. Uh, now applying it in a computer environment or network environment distributed that's a much different thing and then when you apply machine learning uh, you know hence the over two decades uh, you know to get to this place so more complex but more yield much yeah. more yield. oh yeah the, the potential value uh, there nothing nothing comes close obviously uh, you know governments around the world would are, are, are all fighting to uh, to uh, you know not to mention uh, Academics and universities and everybody else, uh, the national labs, um, you know, uh, at least presumably, uh, they would all like to be able to manage their optimize their knowledge yield curve. Of course, uh, there's a lot more to it when you get to adoption um, and uh, obstacles to adoption. Sometimes that's not always the case, but uh, but for many that is the the goal because um, you know we can move uh, we can move society forward uh, at a much more rapid pace. If we can unlock these kinds of uh, values, um, and uh, and you know, it could have uh, profound benefits, and you know when you get right right down to it, um, we do not know. I mean, we cannot know uh, really the future. Um, at some point, um, we may may need these kinds of systems to sur survive as a species, um, and for Earth to survive. So that's the underlying. Uh, you get into the sort of senior level discussions with scientists. I mean, that's that's really the ultimate driver. Wow. So it's the the knowledge. So it's a knowledge management system, right? So that yeah, it's a label that that we that was placed on early back in and when we were running Gwyn when I when I conceived this. Uh, Gwyn was considered a knowledge management network at the time, and it was more primitive. And that was the term that was very popular at the time. It got a little bit hyped up and got ruined, unfortunately. But the bait, like so many things that get overhyped and, and overdone and people trying to make a quick buck on it, was that the, the basic foundation of it was solid. I mean, the intent was solid when it came out of knowledge management. But I've always been bothered by the term um, knowledge management, in part because when you're dealing with humans, humans... Uh, you know, we're, we're an intelligent species, we have free will. Um, the, there is a, the, there was always this sort of mindset, and, and I used to be invited to look at textbooks and PhD thesis and all that, we, even mm -hmm. way back in the 90s, um, and, and, and review stuff, and, and some, some programs, PhD programs. So it's a little bit like what's happened with AI that happened with KM back in the late 90s, but, um, but uh, it was a lot more manual then, and now it's a lot more automated. But, uh, but, but the problem with the term is, is that uh, corporations would off, often interpret it to mean that, you know, you can manage uh, your workforce and, uh, and knowledge like you can uh, a commodity. Um, oh. and, and when you're dealing with humans, uh, that's certainly <laughs> not the case. And actually, the, the, the truth is, is in learning along the way, what you find is, is that sort of the more intelligent people are, the less that is true. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you, you have to motivate them, give them projects that that they're motivated to do and uh, self-motivated and, and there's a lot more to it. So this idea that, you know, you can manage knowledge like it's a commodity or something, even though, yes, the underlying theorem is mathematical. Um, and so that in a way is very similar to a commodity. Um, the, the truth is, is that, um, you know, you have to treat people with respect. You have to, you know, if you get, uh, if you know, go to any environment where uh, where the innovation is is uh, you know, highly productive, any of the top mm -hmm. labs in the world, and uh, and they treat their people very well, mm -hmm. uh, and that's because you you need to to be able to to attract the, those kinds of people. Oftentimes, you're dealing with people that are a lot smarter than you are. So when you have this sort of mindset that you're going to extract knowledge from them, uh, <laughs> that can lead to some really bad things, um, including uh, uh, intentionally undermining your, your own mission, uh, which we've, we've seen it, you know, there's, 
there's like uh, case studies, many case studies where we've seen that actually occur uh, in, in, in organizations where, uh, you know, when it was mismanaged. So, so the term wow. yield management has always kind of bothered me. I've always looked at it, um, in, and that's, that was, as you can see in the name, K-Yield, uh, we can definitely influence the yield curve, right? But we can't dictate it, and we can't, it's not a straight line. We can't, uh, if by using a lot of different uh, methods, uh, we can optimize it, but you certainly can't, uh, it's not a commodity, it's not uh, crop, okay. like crop yields in ag agriculture, uh, the way they look at it. So when you're dealing with the human behavioral aspects and psychology, it's quite different. And so uh, that, that's, it's a, that's kind of why I'm dwelling on it. Um, is there is, today there's, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley mentality is still somewhat, uh, some of the companies, not all of them, they treat their people very well. But they don't, you, you notice they don't compensate the rest of us very well uh, yeah. for contributing our knowledge uh, on the internet or whatever. So, yeah, <laughs> so there's a lot to it to get it right. Um, you know, whether it's in time, inside an organization or, or on an open medium. Interesting. Thanks. So I, I noticed you mentioned something about your, uh, your views on the PhD. So since your, your systems are highly, your solutions are highly creative and unique, uh, I'm interested in knowing what your development process in lab are like and how you think that uh, is, differs from a typical PhD program, like why you think that would be inferior. Yeah, well, it's, it's not so much that I'm against PhDs, but it, my view is more like Dyson's. In fact, I didn't realize it until, uh, until much later, which I, I saw a video of, of you know, Freeman Dyson, his view on it. And, and I look at it quite similarly. Um, the, the, and I ran into it in the 90s when I was doing a lot of PhD, reviewing a lot of thesis and different things. And they, mm -hmm. they, were, uh, they would commit to knowledge management. It would take several years. And by the time they were done with their, their thesis and they got their PhD, knowledge management had already changed. Oh, um, I see. A cycle. So when you dedicate yourself to one thing, um, and in many cases, when you get into life sciences with something that's even, or, you know, uh, physics, or it's just the way academia is structured, you have to focus on one area of contribution. And then, of course, they match that up with a lot of others, economics, whatever it is. So it's, 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 it's mainly a, a factor of the PhD program itself and, and these traditions in academia that I don't think have really kept up. Um, there's some other problems with it. One is, is that, um, you know, you get your degree and then it's, it's a lifetime. And I've known an awful lot of professors in my time that, uh, that were tenured that, that uh, where they had young struggling uh, assistant professors and, and you know, sort of semi-starving that frankly were a lot more current uh, yeah. than the senior professors. Now there has been improvement in recent years and I see that less and less, but, uh, but it was a real problem for a lot of years. You would get people that were stuck in these roles and still very influential. Um, and, uh, and you know, they did get a degree once and, and so I'm, I'm much more of the mindset that learning is continuous. Uh, you can see it in our system design and, uh, and, and adaptive. Uh, but with AI systems uh, especially, uh, it is very cross-discipline. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you really, when you're talking about a building a big system, an enterprise-wide system, architecting and designing it, uh, boy, there is a lot to know. Too much for any single person. And so... Uh, but you know, it, it usually does fall on a single architect. So, so yeah, we tap into all these disciplines to learn from it, but, uh, it, computer science is important, but if you look at some of the leaders in, in AI systems, some of the best I've, I've known, um, have a physics background. They have, uh, they may have a mathematics, uh, some economists I know are very good in data science. I mean, they're, they come from a lot of your life sciences now. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not like data and, and AI systems are, are only the domain of, of the CS department. Um, you know, even though uh, it is true that, uh, that the majority of the leaders that are really pushing the science forward do have a PhD, did come from good programs, and they did focus on AI. I, I think it's more important to have the, the passion and the motivation over a long period of time. 
Um, I do agree that it's, it's, it's very beneficial to have a broad education to start with. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend, in fact, I don't recommend my pathway to most people. Uh, you know, it's just, it's more difficult uh, in many ways. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of my thoughts on the, on the, on the PhD uh, part of it, aspect of it. So maybe I'm just jealous that I didn't get one when I was young, when I was <laughs> So, but uh, it could be part of it, but it, it is, uh, it does make it more difficult in some respects, um, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, getting recognized for your, your contributions, because it is a guild after all. Uh, it's an yeah. guild, uh, and it's an effective one, so. Thanks. So are you saying, so it sounds like you're saying, uh, what you think for the for AI and and the the K yield in in the business environment, we need to move faster and be more into interdisciplinary yeah. to progress at this at the speed of the the economy and the the world in general. Absolutely, that's and, a, and you know and that's pretty well understood now. It wasn't when we were first start, starting to talk about it. One of the reasons I, I developed a relationship with Santa Fe Institute, one of the reasons we moved to New Mexico 11 years ago is because of that, was back in our Gwyn days, we were one of the few, if not the only in the world that were actually experimenting with, uh, yeah. with systems that were cross-disciplinary. Wow. So there were people out there that, that were, were advocating it and understood the potential. Um, and when you get in small rooms and you get, uh, it's very powerful. And I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time in small rooms with, with leading scientists. And it is very powerful when you get in these, these environments where you have uh, a leading biologist, a leading physicist. Uh, uh, and when I say leading, it might not necessarily be famous. It might be a postdoc that is brilliant, you know, that has new ideas. It could be, um, and, 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 or it could be, you know, somebody uh, that is from philosophy. But you get a bunch of people with uh, that are really motivated, that have really done their work, and you get them in one room. Um, it's just super powerful, and you can actually see it and observe the uh, the minds turning and the the innovation and the thoughts. And then later on, you can kind of see it um, impacting their work. Um, and we've over the past twenty five years, we've seen that. And and today, of course, it's much more broadly understood. Um, the, the question is, is, you know, how best to optimize that. Okay. Um, and that's a, that is a challenge, even though, um, you know, by necessity, um, uh, the, the, the PhD programs, I mean, it, it is true that you need to focus very deeply on some of these areas to make any headway, right, for a long time. Um, and that's certainly what we've done um, in, in our work. Um, but it's also kind of foolish not to learn from others. So I mean, and that are doing somewhat similar things. And you can certainly that became more true when things became computerized and you had data, where um, and, and these different methods. Like one of my friends is a is a, a senior professor and he's very well known um, in his field. Um, and uh, and you know he says that. One of the problems with his PhD students and attempting to get cross disciplinary is that uh, that they're still using different terminology and different oh, yeah. language um, that that the the other disciplines still don't know, and you can actually see that in mathematical equations. So they do the different fields use different math to describe in different equations. Well, boy, that that really slows us all down, um, you know, in, in terms of advancing science and and accomplishing things. So yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, and that's, that's one of the reasons Santa Fe Institute does a, 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 they're very good at that. Um, and it's very mindful, they intentionally attract people from our visitors mostly. There's a certain core faculty, but a lot of the value up there are people, you know, they might be on their way to Lionel to make a pre presentation and they stop there first. In fact, I've met several of the of the uh, lab directors in AI um, wow. the years have come through uh, and done presentations on emerging work and uh, you know and we we all uh, sort of help them get published in nature or whatever uh, so it's 
Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it was a good environment. Uh, even though we didn't work on K-Yield, it was beneficial for me. And that, but as we got to the commercialization stage a few years ago, um, I, you know, I just, I'm not as a frequent visitor as I used to be, that's for sure. And, and that's not their thing. They're not, you know, they, they don't build businesses. It's, it's you know, basic uh, theoretical science. And, and so we're not, we're not so much in the theoretical world anymore in our work. So. Nice, thanks. Yeah, it sounds like you've had some uh, really exciting experiences working with uh, different intellectuals in, at the Santa Fe Institute. And also, I definitely have seen what you're saying about different terminologies. I noticed that especially when I took the graduate level physics courses that even within physics, they would, within the physics genre, they would use like five different notations to explain the same things, which just really wastes a lot of uh, the learning time. <clears throat> Yeah, and they get used to it. I mean, after, you know, decades, if you're trained that way, you get to be my age, it gets, it's so ingrained in you, and then you teach your students that, and it sort of gets carried on to the next generation. But when you're dealing with data and trying to make these things, you know, work interoperably, it's not, it's not helpful at all. Oh. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so I, I also wanted to ask you uh, if, if K-Yield was always an artificial intelligence company, and how you view the progression of AI systems since you've embarked on this work? Yeah, no, it, yeah, it's a good question. No, uh, we didn't use the term AI until really it was about 2006 when I applied for the core patent. Um, and it was actually the patent office that, that put that label on it. Wow. In our, in our KS lab, we, we, it, it was a subsector of artificial intelligence, so we used it a little bit then, but back in those days, AI was a bad word. <laughs> uh, you know, you didn't, uh, you know, it was, uh, there was AI winter and the funding was cut for all the different labs, even though we were self-funded and we were very lean, um, it, it wasn't, uh, it, you know, it was, uh, it was the peer pressure on AI was, was in computer science was, uh, was pretty fierce. Um, and so uh, uh, knowledge systems was still sort of uh, okay for a while. But uh. you didn't use the AI, you, you didn't use that term back the, for quite a while. Um, and then, uh, um, and then so we used in the early stage, I mean, one of the first things you have to get right on, on this kind of system is your data structure. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for organization. Um, and, and not just for the uh, for the the meaning or the semantics, so that was a term that we used, and we used semantic enterprise, semantic, and that, you know that's because of uh, uh, the the it was uh, it was the the term that was used um, um, by uh, Tim and uh, the founder of the web to uh, to sort of describe what he wanted to see in in the web. Now on paper it made sense. Turned out that was a terrible marketing name to use, <laughs> semantic, because nobody could relate to it. Um, but uh, and, and in corporations, even though it was accurate, because you're talking about meaning, but that's just part of it. Um, and so when you get into the 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 details, the technology of it, is that well, meaning is very important. But guess what? You start to scale out. That's really important. So how do you scale natural languages? Um, and and, uh, and then uh, how do you embed uh, security into a system? How do you provide governance to it? So when you look at it from a systems perspective, uh, in our view, it's quite a bit different than the way most people are looking, especially when they're talking about just the web and having the web uh, semantically integrated so that it, it works better for search and that sort of thing in the public. <clears throat> when you're dealing with, um, and, and it sort of depends, uh, you know, the more sensitive the information and the data that's involved, the more important those technologies, of, you know, uh, and at scale. Um, th so scale was actually one of the holdups. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Vint Cerf and I used to email back and forth about way back then was the problem with scale. And that was before he joined Google. Um, and of course, that's one of the things Google is, is focused on and become very good at. And so... Uh, the engineering became increasingly important um, in, uh, on how to make these systems work overall. Uh, but yeah, we use semantic, uh, you know, semantic enterprise, uh, semantic data for uh, quite a few years until, um, and actually until even after that. 
uh, but uh, technically it was a, you know, it has the core system has been an AI system all along. We just didn't use it widely. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. So it sounds like you're saying the you're really appreciating the uh, the architecture, the the way that everything integrates. That people maybe don't appreciate that enough, and they put too much uh, hype onto the the AI terminology a little bit. Oh, for sure. Uh, and in, in recent in recent years, you're finding. In fact, uh, Google just recently. Uh, 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 did a, a, a series of articles on that in their blog about, oh, yeah, well, it can, uh, actually, you know, uh, it turns out that how your data is structured means an awful lot when it comes to output of AI systems. And so, yeah, it is, it is extremely important. Um, it, uh, quality in, quality out, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> nice. so it's, it's, uh, I call it data physics, just because there's entropy. There's uh, there's oh, yeah. there's some pretty interesting stuff that we're we've been working on the last few years in terms of, you know, that uh, I guess we'll get into at the end uh, the newest invention uh, that uh, that is more uh, state of the art uh, in terms of what what we're doing. And we just released that recently, but yeah, you know, we didn't talk about it. As a small shop, we are forced to be uh, less open than if we're running a giant monopoly. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, if you're running a giant monopoly, you don't like patents and you don't like these things. But if you're in a small business or you know a small company, a small shop, um, you, you need it uh, because it's uh, when they have market dominance, they don't need IP uh, nearly as much. It's just purely you know for defense. But if you're, and one of the things their greatest fears is somebody comes along and and invent something that's going to displace them. So, so that's why you've seen in the past few years a, a, a big push. Not to say that the patent system is perfect by any means. Uh, it kind of drives me crazy. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we use it for, uh, for that reason. Is because it's, uh, look, if you're a monopoly and you have, if you have uh, especially a strong monopoly, um, you don't want anybody else to have any legal rights uh, because they're just a threat. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so anyhow, that's a, a topic for a different, a different day. Uh, okay. <laughs> nice, that's an interesting perspective. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so can you, given that, can you uh, go into any more de detail about how the K-Yield OS augments business decisions? Or is that uh, too proprietary? No, I can, I can talk a little bit about it, of course. The, uh, yeah, the core patent covered at the time was applied for it initially in 2006. It was approved not until 2011. Um, and part of that was is just a, a sharing of, you know, discussion is that it wasn't technically viable yet. So there's no rush. Um, wow. In fact, you don't want it to be too early because you have less time on the patent. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it actually augments uh, decision making in many ways. And so there's there's a semi automated functions and then there's automated functions in the KEOS. Um, and it's become more automated as it's become more technically viable to do so. Uh, so in the early days, it was much more semi automated, mm -hmm. much more human involvement, in, and it's become more and more automated over time. Um, and uh, and one, of, one of my my old friends um, in, in your industry is Les Videz. And mm -hmm. Les was, um, you know, he won't take anything for it. He won't do anything. Uh, he's an old friend. But he's probably been um, certainly one of my best advisors over the years. Um, and uh, very sought after by entrepreneurs. Now, you know, he's long since retired from Intel. But yeah. Les has been, uh, you know, it's, it, just a, a super... Uh, uh, a super advisor and, and friend. In fact, I just emailed him the other day. He's he's retired on his uh, having a big birthday and and retired to his vineyard up in Sonora. Wow. But a uh, uh, very interesting guy. So he had you know he was one that pretty early on said you know Mark uh, you're probably going to need to automate this as much as possible. And you know he he just learned so much in his early days at Intel and and throughout that experience both as part of the original team members and then later. Um, and, you know, almost everything Les has said over the years in hindsight has turned out to be spot on. Uh, 
Uh, but, uh, but yeah, um, in terms of augmentation of, of decision, for, for one thing, it does more than just decisions. So augmentation productivity um, is one thing that, that the system does um, in, 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 in learning, human learning. So not only tapping into machine learning and deep learning for specific functions, the idea is, is to, uh, to accelerate learning for the people using the system, um, including decision makers. Uh, but to, to just give a couple of examples of how the system uh, augments uh, decision making and, and sort of real life uh, cases that have occurred. And I use this in my videos and stuff and, uh, a little bit. But one is, is the 9-11 uh, uh, because it's the most famous event, preventable mm -hmm. event that's occurred in the past since we've been on this voyage. Um, and in that case, you had the Phoenix memo and the FBI, you actually had a trained anti-terrorist probe, and that was that was his job, mm -hmm. uh, was to to you know research and identify uh, uh, potential threats, uh, terrorist threats to the United States, and then bump it up uh, to the higher up so that uh, appropriate action could be taken. So we had I forget his name. I wish I, I, I it's been a while since I visited this, but. Uh, he uh, he actually identified some of the 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 uh, the people that uh, hijackers of those planes in 9/11 in this Phoenix memo. The individuals they were going to school and airline taking airline course to train as a pilot, but they didn't. They had a very strange profile background yeah. for uh, compared to you know the typical person that's trained to become a commercial airline pilot. And and so he put this in the memo, and then it sat in the FBI. Uh, for you know weeks, uh, and um, and if they were able, to, and they had a pretty good system. Now it wasn't an intelligence system; it was a manual system. But it, uh -huh. it, it had uh, they, they from what I could glean from it, it was a pretty good system for its time. But it wasn't intelligent, um, and it sat there, and nobody did anything with it. Now, at the 9/11 Commission, uh, cited it afterwards, and they found an awful lot. That was a very good. Is one of the things we all learned a lot from. And of course, the, in the intelligence committee since, or community since then, they've invested billions and billions of dollars. So they've, they've solved this problem in, you know, okay. one, of, one of the things that they, they, they failed at was sharing it, not just in the FBI doing something about it, but when you had a, a threat that was that important, it should have been shared with others uh, outside the FBI. And so that's why they reorganized the whole intelligence system. Oh. But, but that one is, it's, 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 it's semi-structured data sitting on the servers. Everything was done right, uh, it was sitting there, and it's just the bureaucracy didn't move fast enough. Well, they get an awful lot of these, right? And so uh, it's it's really not surprising. In fact, the, the more experience you have with large bureaucracies, you 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 learn that this is actually more the norm. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, most of the large human caused crises, which is one of my areas of, of focus. Uh, the, the, the truth is, is that there are Phoenix memos in almost every single event that occurs. There's some sort of expert that is warned. They put it in some sort of, of legitimate form like they're supposed to. They might be internally, they might be externally. And for a variety of reasons, the bureaucracy didn't act on it. Sometimes they're ignoring it. Sometimes they're worried about turf protection. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's various things, politics, uh, but but often it's just the inertia of the bureaucracy and 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 so much busy work to keep you know keep the the machine moving that they just miss yeah. it. Uh, but that was over ten trillion dollars, two wars, uh, tens of thousands of lives lost, thousands of Americans, and 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 a fairly from a technical perspective, pretty darn easy to prevent. Yeah, so it sounds like there, either, there's a semi-automated in that case. It wouldn't have been you know, necessarily fully automated in, in terms of action. But semi-automated, you know, that should have gone to uh, the National Security Council, should have gone to other in intelligence agencies, uh, maybe the local uh, authorities where these guys were living, you know, the, the FAA, uh, whoever. Uh, and, and so, uh, but, you know, that gives you a good idea on a decision making that couldn't occur just because it didn't reach the right people at the right time um, and, and in some cases, they don't understand it uh, correctly, so you can help there. So there's different ways, but that's, a, that's just one example of many. You know, there could be countless.
So that definitely uh, gives me a lot of food for thought. I think I understand where you're going with the system. It's yeah. really interesting. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So that, one, that one's a big one, but there's lots of them. I mean, the same could be. Uh, you know, the same is true, though, in terms of like if you're looking at R and D. Let's say you're a scientist in, in life science. Um, the same is true for all of us, though. Information overload mm -hmm. is a problem. Um, so just the scale of the problem, and that's fundamentally the problem that we're all trying to solve in these kinds of systems is you need access to all this data and high quality data, um, but you need to be able to process it in very specific ways. Yes. To be able to achieve, you know, darn near anything. Um, you know, to prevent fraud and banking for, for any kind of purpose, or even if you're a patient to manage your own, you know, hopefully eventually we'll get there where patients have control over their own data so that they can, they can be a big part of managing their own uh, health rather than just diseases. I mean, there's, there's so many applications uh, for these kinds of systems that to improve. And the more you learn about them, the more potential that you see. You also see some risk, also see some threats that need to be dealt with, but the potential is, is vast and it's real. And then, you know, none of that is hyped. It doesn't, it, it, we have those capabilities today to be able to do those things. It's just, there's obstacles to adoption uh, in most cases. So, yes. we'll get there. you know, we'll get there eventually. I can definitely see how it would improve people's lives and it also probably consequently improve profitability as well. I mean, Oh yeah, I mean the the, the most the, the highest ROI possible in a corporation is prevention of a of a major human caused crisis. So the, some example very quickly some examples there the BP uh, oil spill uh, oh. sixty bill over sixty three billion dollars almost fatal to BP uh, the J P Morgan uh, whale trade I think was something like eight nine billion dollars. Uh, the uh, Wells Fargo sales scandal recently, that's in the billions. The VW uh, emission scandal, that was, uh, that was sort of a criminal thing, but it was an insider risk thing. Uh, last I saw, that was up over 40 billion. Wow. With other companies. So it's, yeah, the ROI, unless you're building a new Microsoft or Apple or Google, there is no higher ROI than preventing those kinds of crises. And the little ones, that occur dramatically, I mean, you know, across the world every day uh, for all of us uh, is sort of the, the low hanging fruit. But boy, they add up. If you're talking about a large organization over a year, uh, you know, and that's not even talking about cybersecurity, you know, some of the other types of events. So yeah, it's, it's the ROA is, is, is really, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, there's, there's a decision that should be automated. The problem is that they don't understand the systems enough to make wise decisions. Uh, the, it is a problem in understanding and misunderstanding. So. Wow, it sounds like your uh, system definitely, and that your your way of thinking, applying more systematic thinking by putting it into computers can really help bring us closer to a utopia in a sense. I mean, well, I wouldn't go that far. I, yeah, I wouldn't go that far at all. Uh, for me, it's more like um, it's just really stupid not to prevent these things because, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it, when you're talking about uh, prevention of disease, uh, loved ones, that sort of thing, that's, that's, that couldn't be more obvious, right? Uh, all of us share that. Um, you'd have to be inhuman not to share that. But uh, just from my business perspective in a corporation, I mean, most of these leaders in these companies lose their jobs. When you have a major crisis like that, um, the first thing that happens in many cases is they fire the senior management. Uh, so from a career, even if you're just very, you know, very uh, self-centered, uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, it makes no sense at all not to, not to do it. Now, really in reality, the question you get down to it is, is they're saying, well, why don't we just build it ourselves in internally? And that's what we've run into quite mm -hmm. a few times. Um, and, uh, you know, we can get into that more detail, but uh, it's kind of stupid there in terms of making a decision. We've been at this nearly a quarter of a century now, um, and we have a lot of trade secrets. 
Uh, and there's about 40% of the system, if they're building it from scratch, that's redundant. It's universal to any system. It's, it's a little bit like what Bill Gates was faced with in the, in the early 1980s with the, uh, with the desktop operating system and Microsoft Office that my late friend Russell Borgman was deeply involved with, is that the reason why they won that battle um, is because one, the other software companies were not willing to integrate and work with each other. So mm -hmm. it was very expensive and difficult. We are faced with something similar today with these walled gardens and integration. Even though it's better, there's APIs, that's still an issue. Um, but the, the primary reason is, is that it's the, the redundancy. How much sense does it make for every organization to attempt to build their own office suite from scratch? <laughs> that's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. And it, you know, it costs an enormous amount of money. It's crazy. Uh, but if you don't under, but they did the same thing. There's a lot of companies that did. They were building wow. back then. They were trying it, but it didn't work too good. And we see the same thing happening now. A lot of companies are trying, but this is clearly a case where we really have a new, uh, a, a, a generational shift in technology, and we need new companies to to fill these niches, especially when new companies are free from any other conflicts. You know, we don't we don't own a grocery store or <laughs> you know, a chain or any of these other things. This is all we do. So it's 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 as pure as you can get. Uh, let's put it that way, right? So <laughs> I, 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 it, I that's an interesting analogy about Microsoft. I think I see what you're saying. Like as we reach greater and greater levels of automation, dealing with higher and higher levels of of information integration, people there are always going to be people who are resistant to letting the computers take over. So well, they want to take yeah. care of it themselves because they're paranoid. And, and for good reason. I mean, good reason with some of the companies out there and the cultures. So you do have to have governance in a very careful way. Uh, for example, we don't want access to their data other than it was absolutely necessary. I mean, they keep ownership, they keep control. Uh, but there's also a, a factor of the in insider risk in a lot of these major events, it was due to the insiders. So if you allow them to build it, and you even some of them no. years. So for example, the Capital One risk, that was a, a former AWS engineer a couple of years later, and they had the technical ability to hack into it because of that experience at AWS. And they hacked it as a, that, that gal from Seattle and she hacked into uh, Capital One. And you, you know you have a, a situation like that where uh, it's very important whether it's a vendor or whether it's internal, uh, but insider risk, like for example VW in the criminal case, uh, they uh, they at least in the in the trial, and some of them were convicted. I didn't follow it that closely, but there were software engineers involved with that uh, with that fraud, um, and and allegedly with the CEO of the company. So you had an internal group that was doing this and ended up being one of the most expensive things that happened to VW, caused all kinds of embarrassment for, uh, for Germany. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, it's, it's across other, you know, it was, a, it was a big deal for the auto industry, one of the That's most important industries. So, you know, it's, you really want to avoid those things. And so you have to set them up very, very carefully uh, from a security uh, and, you know, uh, uh, regulatory perspective, governance perspective, how to, how to do it, whether it's internal or external. Uh, you need to be very careful how you do these, for sure. I see. Yeah, by doing it, using an external system, you can, it's one more way to have like a external oversight to help prevent the corruption from being built into the new system. When it's done proper, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a big caveat. But for example, our Humcat program, we did, we designed a system for, it's called Humcat, it's, it means uh, prevention of human cause crises or catastrophes. Um, and that, <clears throat> that uh, another one has been slow to adopt, but we were very innovative and broke some new ground is that we can, we can match uh, bonds. They're called ILS bonds. I won't go into too much detail here, but that's one way you could do it is insurance linked securities like for hurricane catastrophes. And, and so uh, some of these island nations have these cat bonds, they're called cat bonds, and it's a sub-industry in insurance. Wow. You can, you can do that for an enterprise, something very similar, and then have third party, so you have very specific, specific metadata 
that is shared with the bondholders or it could be regulators or other third parties in those situations where let's say you have a nuclear oversight regulator you could do the same thing there uh, where you you have the system and you just share very specific data with uh, you know in a secure manner and so that for example if you're a bondholder an insurance holder you have these big uh, and you don't know the problem is is afterwards you don't know what's going on inside these organizations and especially in their belly their own systems i mean they can they cover up they do a lot of things once once bad things happen especially if it's criminal or going to end your career uh cover-ups are the norm they're not the ex exception so um there's ways to prevent this now again we're talking about understanding the technology and it's one of those things that's a lot easier to show than it is to, because it creates a lot of fear actually it's really nothing to be afraid of it's it's really not much different than what we have in our cars now in terms of semi-automated uh, prevention functionality that helps wow. prevent incidents. really the same sort of thing it's just across the whole organization right wow. it's, it's not just uh, not just a car so Thanks. Some of the same technology, actually. So, thanks. So that now we'll uh, get into your your latest creation, the synthetic genius machines. Okay. So I, I would like to ask you. So a person seems complex and hard to predict, although recent ev other events, uh, namely Cambridge Analytica, helping people get elected by predicting people's behavior and their desires off like 300 facebook likes yeah uh, i mean that makes it seem like people are easy to predict but yeah, i think it's a, i think it's been a lot easier to predict uh more so than people were aware of for quite a while we just assumed that it, it wasn't but yeah if you're collecting enough data on them it's a lot easier to predict behavior than than, uh, than is commonly understood but any of it, yeah. With, good, example, so, good example there. <laughs> so for your creation of synthetic genius machines, yeah. uh, especially with them, you, you've mentioned something about creating synthetic geniuses from far in the past, like Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, how do you choose what type of features to emulate with your systems to create these synthetic genius machines? Yeah, yeah. well, the uh, it depends on on it depends on a lot of things, and I can't get into too much detail on how we choose what uh, what features to use. But but I can share some examples. Um, one example, and that was the reason for filing the patent application recently, so that I could share it to you know some presentations that were coming up. But um, one example is if you want to accelerate R and D, uh, for example, um, and uh, and let's not use Leonardo. Let's use a. a, a uh, a scientist in again life sciences just for uh, sake of example and let, let's say they're working on a new drug compound or they would like to do a new dr drug compound so if they're using this um, you know in their own organization their own research or if they had a network of researchers um, and so you would combine uh, published works and you would take from videos or any other it can be any kind of media um, and we would we would look in that case depending on the very specific disease and the very specific things that they were looking for they could actually like if this was in part of the k yield os which i it's a k yield os installed and there's individual modules well the individual modules are are automatically tailored the data to the needs of that individual. So wow. if there's a scientist working on a certain project, uh, let's say uh, let's say it's a physicist working on, um, uh, well, in New Mexico here, we have a lot of nuclear work. So uh, mm -hmm. it could be a nuclear weapon system or it could be nuclear fusion, which I, you know, nuclear fusion is one area I would really like to apply K-Yield OS to to see if we could help accelerate because of the, the benefits uh, that would be massive benefits. but. Um, uh, that be used as an example. In that case, you wouldn't use Leonardo. You may, you know, you may want to use Einstein, who, who has a lot more publications, uh, and uh, and I've read most, if not all of it. Um, in that case, there there would probably be a lot more that we could glean from. But in, for the most part, they would be looking at very specific, uh, very deep R and D uh, from the scientists in that specific lab, their team. Um, and, and believe it or not, a lot of this comes from their own workflow. 
Um, and we just collect it and process mm -hmm. it in a different way. And then we integrate other uh, features uh, that uh, with it to accelerate and use some proprietary technology to, to accelerate um, with the idea of being accelerating R&D, which is, you know, to me, if uh, looking back, uh, if I can contribute significantly to that, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be very pleased. Uh, so, uh, so that's one example, but it could be life sciences, it could be anything, and it may not even be in r and I mean, it could be for any purpose at all. So we call a synthetic genius machine just because that's where most of the value is. So the big value, if you can use the features and some of the patterns, uh, not just in one genius, but across disciplines or across geniuses, there are similar patterns to work behaviors and um, and in uh, in some of the ways the minds work in these mm -hmm. different geniuses, um, and if you can enhance um, uh, the everyday geniuses, like the old saying is, is everybody's a genius two or three times maybe in their life, but they don't write it down or they don't do anything <laughs> with it usually. So the the idea being here is that our work products are already there, we're already working. Um, and we may not even recognize it, and we come across something like this. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, kind of neat little things that we can do with a properly designed system. But even in a standalone um, synthetic genius machine and knowledge cre creation system, we, we, there are some pretty interesting things that you can do. For example, um, uh, let's just uh, get out of science and R&D for a second and, th and think of leaders of organizations or leaders of of uh, nations um let's let's say a general let's mm -hmm. say you're the chairman of the joint chiefs and you have some very serious decisions to make we could use features from the generals throughout history so these guys go to training their entire lives i grew up mm -hmm. in a military family so i mean i have some 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 awareness of this dad flew a lot of those guys later on in his career and uh, chairman and joint chiefs and those those type but if you um they're very good at training but but to to carry all that in your mind all the time for everything potential uh, uh decision that you might have to make is kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. especially when your memory is as bad as mine is uh, <laughs> you don't want to have to rely on that computers are nearly perfect uh in their memory so uh, so that would be one thing where you could, they could, they could ask, well, how would, let's say, uh, General MacArthur, uh, what, what would he think about this? Uh, what would George Washington think about this? What would, you know, and in those cases, they, they are, uh, a lot of those are, uh, there's, a, there's a surprising amount of data, a surprising amount of, and then there's also work products that have been written about them that you can incorporate. So there's, there are scholars that have spent their entire career studying a handful or even one uh, wow. you know, great mind in history. And they can, can, their work, their published work can contribute an awful lot to this. Um, and then we actually have the ability to do real time, um, you know, add things real time in your workflow, uh, contribute things. So uh, there's a variety of different ways that you can do it in both automated and semi-automated uh, methods to to add to it, but you're right. I mean, some of the geniuses that you might want to tap from you know, 2,000 years ago, uh, there's not a, a, an awful lot of uh, data to go from, so you need to fill in some blanks. Um, but the, interesting enough, when you study it, there are patterns, there are things that you can pick up with, and, and then when you combine that with advanced technology and uh, you know new types of encryption, uh, we have a symbolic uh, uh, a representation of these genius features. And, and you know, some of the people, some of my colleagues in the AI systems, for example, uh, uh, they, they, th there's, there's two ways of thinking about this. Some think that uh, symbolic languages are, are bad for learning, machine learning, but others um, have been quite successful. And, and these are some of the leading uh, thinkers in AI systems. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 a lot of it, uh, you know, just share a little bit of, of trade uh, secret here is that uh, it depends on how you deal with it. S symbols are not necessarily static. That, that's one hint to it, uh, but there's quite, quite a bit that goes on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. The potential is, is, is exciting, but 
uh, you know, it's another one of those large systems, so that you need, uh, uh, we haven't been able to test this with rigor at scale yet. Uh, high degree of confidence, but it's going to take it's going to take a, a, a fairly large uh, resources to test it at scale. It sounds so. very interesting and exciting. Thanks for sharing. So I have one more question actually about it. So is it something? Is this an automated uh, genius machine generation process? Like somebody, if they say, "I want to be like that person," I want that person's inspiration. They can search any person's name. Or is it something that's kind of manually created? Well, we, we, we don't, we purposely don't boil the ocean, so mm -hmm. to speak, like Google does for anybody in the world. Now, eventually, as you build the system, it gets out, there's going to be more and more choices. Okay. Uh, but, but initially, uh, one of the benefits of the, of the system is to limit to only specific geniuses that you know are proven cool. uh, masters. Um, so that you don't have nearly as much noise in the data, the data quality is much, much higher. Um, and that's a little bit different than some of the big data techniques used in search and some of the other things uh, that, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, for example, that's one of the problems they have. There's so many false positives. There's so many, uh, you have to really process enormous amounts of data uh, to, to be able to, you know, filter, and then you have to filter out so much to, is that, you know, is that a, a cat crossing, uh, the road or, uh, is it, you know, is it something else? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it a human or, or is it something else? And you talk about decision-making automated, uh, you know, some of the ethical concerns about, um, do, who do we save the driver or the, or the pedestrian? Yeah, uh, difficult questions there. So you need me to be very accurate. We don't suffer from those in this particular system. We don't suffer from those kinds of issues. You could be very, very uh, specific on um, on the masters. And it's not to say that there are some masters out there that haven't been proven that have an awful lot to to add to this. Um, and I don't want to sound elitist in this, even though the name sounds terribly elitist. Uh, but there's a pragmatic reason why you focus on these proven masters because they, they, you know, Leonardo invented the the helicopter in in the late 1400s. I mean, it's to me kind of stupid not to tap into that uh, if you can. And uh, um, you know, and, and as I say in the in the presentation that I did recently in New Mexico conference, I mean, the, even today, the the most powerful supercomputer in the world is still our human brain. It's much more efficient. Uh, there's some that are being built now, Lawrence Livermore with Cray's building, supposedly going to match the brute power of the human brain. But uh, still there's, uh, there's qualitative issues in the human brain, creativity and, and things like that, that we know very little about. Um, and, and so when you have a, uh, and, and by the way, they dissected and, and they studied Einstein's brain very, yeah. very closely. Um, and, uh, and surprising enough, all, uh, many of the assumptions about Einstein's brain were inaccurate. Uh, they weren't accurate at all. He had a fairly normal brain. It was just, for whatever reason, much more efficient and powerful than, uh, than mine, certainly. Uh, <laughs> I would have not come up with that theorem. There's no way in the world uh, that I would come up with some of the things he came up with. So, yeah, that's a little bit on the, on the, uh, on the synthetic genius machine. Nice, thanks. Yeah. That that uh, makes that makes sense why you would want to limit it. Actually, I understand now because people could choose poor role models or geniuses to follow, and then yeah, they will learn things. Really, yeah, really specific things, especially when you get into technical areas and R and D. Uh, it it uh, you know there is a risk of you don't want to cut off their creativity. So and that's why I like what the individual module on our K Yildo was. Uh, there's actually a data valve sort of thing that where you can control and you can open it up as wide as you want for massive creativity or dial it down. But, uh, you know, my own personal philosophy is, is that you, do, you wouldn't want to rely just on those masters. Uh, but for certain things, they can be very powerful to, uh, you know, uh, let's face it, if I could on some of these issues, um, you know, if I had access to uh, an Einstein or, a, you know, you'd take your pick, um, yeah. it would be really nice to bounce some things off of them uh, and, and see what they think about it. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea here. Um, and uh, 
but yeah, it's kind of exciting. That's it's been fun. I've uh, been working on that for quite a few years, and and just now recently bringing it together. Timing, I think, is right. Technically, I think the components are there now where where uh, it's certainly viable to do. So amazing. Thanks. Thanks for coming and taking the time to interview and share your perspectives and your tech, the ideas behind your technology, Mark. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. So. Uh, all right. Let's see.